It is very important to understand who you are because if you don't understand who you are, you won't understand how you ought to act. <clears throat> and if you don't understand how to act, then you'll never know how you should live your life. And if you don't know how to live your life, you can live a life where you never get a chance to fulfill what God gave you life for. And we don't want nobody to exit into eternality and not fulfill what you're supposed to do in your earthly existence. You see, my friends, my brothers and my sisters, there's a problem that exists in this world and even in this church. And I want to speak that problem to you today. And I hope and pray that your ears are open and your minds are willing and able and ready to understand. There has been an evaporation of biblical application that is destroying our nation. What that simply mean is God has made this thing so simple, but we make it so complicated. Uh, when you look at the Bible, there are many biblical characters that we admire, people we love, people that we model, that we model our lives after. But the problem is, is that every Bible character had the same issue. And that is when they did not do what God wanted them to do, they found themselves in trouble. And I want you to hear this. When you hear the word of God taught, proclaimed, or preached, what God simply asks of you and me and our leadership and our membership and the Newburgh Nation is to simply do what he says do. And if you and I never learn anything from church about applying God's word, then we're always never, we're never going to be able to achieve what God intended for you to achieve because you don't understand the importance of applying the word of God. Now that word apply, we see everywhere else. Somebody says you need some money. First thing they tell you to do is apply for a job. If there's something that your parents tell you to do, all they want you to do it uh, is to apply it so that things will get well in your life. And the issue that I have, that you have, is that our lives get worse when we do not apply God's word. And when you learn how to apply God's word, let me tell you what it does. It puts you on a different playing field than everybody else. Because when God gets ready to hand out blessings, he's going to hand out blessings to folk who do what he tell them to do. So the difference between you and somebody else is not that you're better. You just learned uh, how to apply God's word. I wish I had somebody that knew how important it is to apply the word of God. Because if you don't, listen, church uh, is, is good that church is social. But it's better when church is spiritual. 
because you can come to church and be social and never be spiritual. Yeah, you can come to church and see your friends and never do what the word of God says to do and then have the unmitigated gall, the chitlins <clears throat> and the guts to ask God to do more for you and want God to accept you doing less for him. So if you want to be blessed, like I believe you want to be blessed, the way to be blessed is to apply God's word. And when you learn to apply God's word, your situation may have not changed. But anybody know what Sam Cook prophesied that my change is coming? Anybody want to give God glory that uh, Sam Cook already told us that your change is coming? Amen, somebody. But you got to position yourself in a place where God, when he gets ready to uh, bless you, that you do what he tells you to, so God can be there to bless you. Now, here's the problem. Here's the problem. Somebody shout the problem. Is that many times we come to church, uh, we get encouragement from brothers and sisters in Christ, and all that's good, and that's what God wants. <clears throat> but what we got to learn to do is apply God's word when we hear it. So if I had to give you a sermonic title to today's teaching, it would simply be do it now. Do it now. Do it now. When my daddy told me to do anything, I knew what that meant. That didn't mean do it when you want to do it. That didn't mean pray about it. That didn't mean you can come up with an excuse. That meant if you don't do it right now, there's going to be some furniture moving around this house. There's going to be some belts being unbuckled. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me today. That means whatever he said, he wanted you to do it. Now, do it. Now, when you read God's word, do it. Now, because we're in a race. You say, well, Brother Jones, I can barely move. I don't care. You're still in a race. <clears throat> You're not in a foot race. You in a race for your life. Because can I tell you something that's going to bless your life for the rest of your life if you apply it to your life? You and I are in a race with time. You, you, you and I are in a race with time. Now, time is a metric that we use to quantify and qualify uh, the allotted period where God has done things within human history. And so what time is, is something that we qualify in seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years, decades, millenniums. And Time is not on our side. Let's just be honest with you. Let's just go here. You and I, if we're just going to be honest today, man, we're in a race against death. And don't let the death angels be faster than you. So whatever it is that you're going to do, whatever it is you know you need to do, What's my sermon title? Yeah. Lean on your neighbor and give him my sermon title. Yeah. Lean on the other neighbor and give him my sermon title. Yeah. And what the world doesn't realize is that you're racing against time. You think 
you got time. You don't have no time. I, several people from our family contacted my wife last night, concerned about us. <clears throat> they saw on the news that there was a parent shooting on I-75 somewhere near London, Kentucky. And everybody in South Carolina was concerned about us. And we told, did we tell y'all five years ago, we live in Louisville, not London? We ain't said nothing about no London, praise God. We said Louisville, not Lexington, not London. But they don't know. We just happy they were concerned about us. My point is, child of God, that you could be on the interstate. Going to do some good. And somebody is targeting your vehicle on the interstate trying to do evil. So when you and I read our Bibles, what I want to impress upon your spirit today is it's not about how much you read, it's about how much you apply. I would rather spend less time reading and more time applying. Because you can read 10, 10 chapters and do nothing and read 10 verses and do something. So I want you to know how important this is. Now, as it relates to what we're going to be talking about today, the pristine apostle Peter picks up his powerful pen and gives us uh, a real uh, understanding about our character and behavior. So when we read behavioral passages in scripture, most times a lot of people don't think about this is something that he wants you to do. I've come today to tell you that not only does he want you to do this, he wants you to realize that if you do not do it, then you're missing out on your blessings. And how many of you know you need blessings every day? Anybody know you need blessings every day? Now, if you know you need blessings every day, like I need blessings every day, uh, your blessings will hinge upon your ability to do one thing, and that is apply God's word. So when you read what Peter writes, Peter is writing to a people that are in a Gentile, unfamiliar territory and under persecution. The idea of persecution carries the idea of aggressively pursuing someone with the intent to pose harm, hurt, or danger against them. They were under a religious and social persecution because of their religious convictions. And not only that, they would have every excuse to do whatever they wanted to because they were under persecution. But uh, God wanted Peter to let them know that regardless of what you're going through, that doesn't give you a free pass to act any kind of way you want just because you're going through something in your life. As a matter of fact, let's go deeper, Peter. I want you to tell them that I still expect kingdom character and behavior no matter what they go through even a persecution because God is always I told you last week trying to put your behavior on display because sometimes it's how you act in the valley that God will use to lift you to the mountaintop and I want you to clearly understand today uh, time is not on our side. And if you know you need a blessing, you got to apply what Peter says. Now, what he does is he gives us a spiritual summons uh, in this text. And he says in verse eight to sum, to sum up, he gives seven imperatives for people in persecution so that they would know how God wanted them to behave. The first one he says is you got to be harmonious. Uh, that means uh, with the same mind. You got to be in harmony with the people of God who are trying to accomplish the purpose of God. Then he says you must be sympathetic. In other words, that's where we get uh, the word sympathy. In other words, you, you must have a feeling of your fellow Christian. If they're going through it and feel, feeling bad, you ought to love them enough that you feel bad about what they're going through as if you were going through it yourself because I am sympathetic toward what other people who have like-minded precious faith are going through. Then he says you got to be brotherly. You got to love your brothers, love your sister. Then he says kind-hearted, which means that you got to have compassion. Then he says humble in spirit. In other words, in your spirit, you need to be humble and see yourself low because if you 
you see yourself low, God knows how to exalt you. How many people want God to exalt you? But listen, he can't exalt you if you're already up there. Okay. Then he says two things I want to share with you that I know we struggle with in church. <clears throat> he says, not returning evil for evil. I lost half of you there. <clears throat> Cause we got a pistol mentality in the church. We got a, we, we, we got to run you over with a car mentality. <clears throat> uh, 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 don't, we don't want folk to die before we get them. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we want to get them back. Right. Uh, let me just tell you something. Uh, you, when you do that, hear this, you are missing out on your blessings. I read somewhere, brother Sanders, when God told Abram, who he changed his name to Abraham, he says, I will bless those <clears throat> that bless you and I will curse those who curse you. So blessing and cursing belong to God. He said, I'm going to curse the folk who curse you. So what's the message to us? Stop cussing. Don't you curse them when they curse you because cursing don't belong to you. In other words, we have to change our mentality in terms of how we behave because God doesn't want you to return evil to somebody else who was evil to you. Let me pause here parenthetically and throw this in the sermon and gumbo while I make my rule. Y'all okay this morning? All right, here it is. I want you to understand uh, th this is just ironic. Uh, it is really, mm, it is biblical. I don't have a text for it. But it's just, it's just interesting to me that when you look at the English word evil, <clears throat> somebody shout evil. We know that is to do the opposite of what God wants and to do exactly what Satan wants. But when you flip the word evil around, it spells out the word live. So that means if you want to live, <laughs> you got to turn around <laughs> from doing evil. <laughs> Give God a praise if you want to live because you're saying, I'm going to turn around. I'm going to flip that thing. Amen, somebody. I, I want to live, but you got to turn away from evil. And that is really the basis of the Bible and how, how God sent Jesus to help us know how to live. Because what I'm concerned with is churches that's filled with innocent, genuine, sincere people who don't live right. And, and we have made coming to church the end when that's just the beginning. So let me give you a way to look at it. When you come here, you're coming to hear what God wants you to apply and you're leaving here with a mind made up to apply what you heard. Because the world ain't going to get no better if the church don't get no better. And let me just tell you something. I know how we do. We, we want to be heard. We want to be seen. We, wanna, we want people to know we're doing good. But let me just tell you something about this time business. <clears throat> if you're 50... In 70 years, nobody will be talking about you. If you're 70, in 50 years, nobody will be talking about you. How do you know that, Brother Jones? Because let me tell you something. We're headed to the land of the forgotten. All of us will be forgotten. How do you know that, Brother Jones? Tell me what your great grandparents' names were. Do you have a picture of them? Some of you do, most of you probably don't. Most people cannot go beyond Big Mama. Nobody is talking about people who live 200 years ago every day. And so the urgency of understanding time and doing it now is to simply say that you do not have a long time to do what God is asking you to do so that you can have an enormous impact on this earth. We'll, we'll turn down God to do something that has no redemptive value. And, and I understand you want to be remembered, but it's better to be redeemed. So, so just know that every day you should be working towards glorifying God through your behavior. So he says, don't return evil for evil. Watch this. Here's where we really go low with Christian folk uh, or insult for insult. In church, when you insult folks who insult you and you return evil for evil, notice what you miss out on your calling. Notice what you miss. The Bible says in verse number eight, 
or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. Wait a minute. He's saying when you get insulted, when you have evil perpetuated against you, don't do that back, but give a blessing. He wants you to not only know you are a blessing, he wants you to be a blessing so he can give you a blessing. Now, the word that he uses is the Greek term eulogio, which is where we get our English word eulogy, which means to speak well of. It, what God is saying is, is that if you my child, I want you to behave the way I want you to, despite people not behaving well around you. So if you could talk about them or if you could insult them, why don't you just speak a blessing over them? You know, this, you know, you know what you need to say? That's OK. But I pray for you, though. And I don't mean P.R.E.Y. pray. I mean, P.R.A.Y. pray. Because when people insult you and do evil, you got to know you've done the same thing to somebody. And the same grace you wanted God to give you, you need to give to somebody else. So what I really want to tell you today is God wants you to demonstrate good behavior. He wants you to demonstrate good behavior. Notice the rest of the text in verse number eight. This will bless your life. But instead, giving a blessing, instead, for you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Somebody shout inherit. Now, beloved, the word inherit is very important for us to understand because that means that God is storing up something for you. God is giving you something for your possession. God wants you to have something of value, but you won't get what God has for you of value if you pay back people the, the way they treat you. So what God says is when you do what I tell you to do in your behavior and you don't say what comes naturally to you. You do you, you do know that some stuff come natural sometime, right? And, and stuff come natural because your life has been conditioned in a certain environment where if everybody around you cuss. It's just natural for you to cuss. If everybody around you handle conflict that way, it's natural for you to do the same. God says your behavior got to be different because I want you to display a godly behavior and good behavior. So even when you could do what you want to do, don't do it. Say the right thing and be a blessing and bless somebody else and I will bless you. Because God is storing up blessings for you. Do you not know that God is storing up blessings for you? And God wants to come through for you like a spiritual FedEx man, UPS man, and deliver a blessing to your door. But he wants you to behave the right kind of way so he can give you what he want to give you. Because even your parents uh, did not reward you for bad behavior. They punished you. For bad behavior. And God is the same way as our father. So he wants us to demonstrate good uh, behavior. Because if you don't understand this. If you don't get this. I want you to know. That then God can't give you what he want to give you. And I'll be honest with you. If God just. If God just give me peace. I'll be alright. Any. See you got to go through some stuff. To know the value of Peace. And peace is not being away from issues because some of you know that your issues got issues. Your problems got problems. So it is not the, the absence of issues. It is the presence where you are not disturbed by the disturbances around you. So all hell could be breaking loose, but I still got joy. I still got love. I still got patience. After all the things, y'all are going to help me in here. I've been through. I still got joy. I still got love. Amen, somebody. It, it is when you know uh, who God is and that God is pulling the uh, spiritual strings and controlling everything around you because God is getting ready to unfold your blessing. And he, he, here's what the um, uh, Hebrew writer says. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 3, 
verse 7, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 7. The Hebrew writer does something interesting. He, beloved, he refers back to Psalm 95, verse 7 through 11. So when the Hebrew, anytime you read the Bible and you see all those bold caps, all caps, uh, that means the writer is referring to a context from the Old Testament to giving you a, a proof text of what has already taken place through uh, the written word. And what he does is he refers to Psalm 95, verse 1, uh, 7 through 11, and he tells us something powerful. He says, today, somebody shout today. Amen. Hebrews, Hebrews 3, 7 uh, says, uh, therefore, just as the Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me as in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Now, three things I want you to see from Hebrews 3, 7. When he says today, he's dealing with time. He says, when you hear my voice, that is a way to teach you about what to do and when to do it. So I see teaching. When he says, do not harden your heart, he's dealing with temperance. So in order to understand the importance of biblical application, you got to understand time. You don't know if you got the time to do it tomorrow. And, and time is, is something that you need to do right now, because the only time you know you got a chance to do it is right now. So he says, today, that's time. When you hear my voice teaching, do not harden your heart. That's temperance. So do you, can you follow that? Do you follow when you hear the word of God to apply it? When he gives you those seven powerful imperatives, do you say, I want to be more harmonious? Do you say, I want to be sympathetic? Do you say, I want to be brotherly? Do you say, I want to be humble in spirit? Do you say, I want to be kind hearted? Do you want to say, I'm not going to return evil for evil? Do you say, I'm not going to insult uh, want somebody else who insults me? Do you do those things? Because if you don't, you're not applying the word of God. And I'm telling you that many of us need to check our character. Because character is the mental and moral qualities that are most consistent with your behavior. So if you are more consistent with doing something over and over again, that says that's just your character. And when you turn on Facebook, <clears throat> y'all got quiet through there. Be careful. What you put out, because it says a lot about your what? Your character. Because your character is emblematic of your behavior. And your be behavior should be emblematic of your Savior. And how many of you know we got a good Savior in Jesus Christ? Come on, somebody. You ought to want to spend the rest of your life uh, living a transformed life because of what Jesus has done for you. So two things I want to give you today, and the lesson will be yours. Number one, uh, I want you to know, uh, bless those who do not bless you. That's how you get the blessing. Uh, this is how you get the blessing spiritually. Bless those who do not bless you. You know, in chapter two of first Peter, chapter three, they kind of end the same way. What Peter basically does is he ends with the best example that he could ever end with by using Jesus Christ, because Jesus was the model example of what we should do when people do wrong to you. See, we get so caught up in trying to get back at them and trying to hurt them that we end up not blessing him. So I want us to clearly understand that it could be that your breakthrough won't come until you learn how to apply the word of God. And if that is you, what God wants you to not only understand is that's what he wants you to do. God is giving us the time today. He wants us to do it. Now, he wants you to love now. He wants you to repent now. He wants you to respect your spouse. I ain't get no brothers to, to shake your head or smile or nothing. You, you said you said uh, love your spouse. Hey, brother's head start going down like. But Joan, you just don't know what she did to me. 
Brother Joan, you just don't know how she hurt me, boy. And I always had to tell people sympathetically, I, I, I understand we're all emotional, we're all sensitive, and we all want to be respected. But what I got to do uh, as a man of God is I got to refer you back to how God saw you when you broke God's heart. And God still loved you. Let's give God some praise for loving us in spite of us when we broke God's heart. You broke God's heart, gave you all that wisdom, all that word, all that love, and you still went out and parted. You still went, went out and embarrassed yourself. You still went out and lost your faculties over a substance that you drunk or you ingested. Say amen when you can. It may be tight, but it's, it's right. So if God was that patient with you, Man, you better love your wife. You better love your husband. You better be quick to forgive because you only got a certain amount of time uh, to have somebody on this earth. Then, then all of us are going to tiptoe out of time into eternity. And what I'm sent here to do, brothers and sisters, is prepare you. I'm sent here to prepare you. I'm sent here to encourage you, teach you how to evangelize and, and show you how important it is to be educated in the word of God. But if you're not prepared to meet Jesus, it's going to be a surprise for you. And you want Jesus to know you now so that y'all can have a heavenly embrace that 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 you appreciate his word. You love him for what he did for you. And you and I tried to do everything we could to be obedient to the master. Because I'm telling you, man, heaven is going to be a great place to go. It's going to be an awesome place to be. And it is a place where we'll have no more cares of the world. No more worries. No more tears. No more bad thoughts. No more temptation no more light bills i thought i would get something there I, you know in the summer you got to run your stuff a little harder because of the okay y'all y'all don't like that one but um no more insurance no more mortgages no more car notes no more bill collectors you ought to give god praise that we go into the no more land <laughs> We're going to the no more land. Amen, somebody. Do me a favor. Just take somebody with you. Number two, not only does he want you to bless those who don't bless you, he wants you to do what's right despite having to suffer. <clears throat> Let me tell you what he does in the next adjoining verses. Let's look at 1 Peter 3, 9. Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead for you will call for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing for the one who desires life to love and see good days. Notice this, please. Must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it for the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those <clears throat> who do evil. Let me explain to you what Peter is doing now. Peter, as I told you earlier, when you read the Bible and it's all caps, like you see on the screen there, uh, Peter is referring to an Old Testament pericope, which simply means section of scripture. And what he does is Peter goes back in the middle of his thought. And his thought is teaching people to have the right kind of behavior, despite being around some evil and wicked people. So to elongate that thought, to express that idea he has a proof text of Psalm 34. 
Now, let me remind you of Psalm 34. Many of you have it on your cubicles. Many of you have committed that to memory. One brother uh, got it on his voicemail. I will bless the Lord <clears throat> at all times. And his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul boasts, makes its boast in the Lord. The humble hear it and will rejoice. Watch this. Oh, magnify. I said, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Y'all miss your cue to shout. Let us exalt. Y'all ain't opening up your mouths. Let us exalt his name forever together. I want you to know that this psalm was penned by a man we all know by the name of King David. This psalm was penned by David because David found himself in a position where God blessed him. David found himself in a position where God delivered him. David found himself in a precarious place that he did not want to be, but David had the wherewithal to cry out to God. How many of you know uh, you need to cry out to God when you need God to do something for you that you cannot do for yourself? So that's what David did. Can't you see him? He's on the run. Saul is trying to kill him. And he had to leave once he was notified about what was uh, coming toward him in terms of an appending persecution. So David leaves. He comes uh, to the prophet uh, and the prophet tells him uh, some things. Uh, he, the prophet said, first of all, what are you doing here, David? Uh, I'm in Psalm, excuse me, I'm in First Samuel 21. Uh, David, what are you doing here? You ain't got no sword and you don't have no men with you. And David, he didn't know that David was on the run. So David lied and told him that he had a special mission from King Saul. In, in other words, David was lying because Saul was trying to run after him and kill him. But David had to tell the prophet, no, no, I'm by myself on a special mission. And uh, you got any food? <laughs> Oh, we just got the consecrated bread, but you know, that's consecrated. What, what David said, well, let me get that anyway, because I'm, <clears throat> I'm hungry in here. Uh, it got a sword. Uh, no, David, all sword I got is the one that you killed Goliath with. He said, that'll work. That'll work. That'll work. I'll take that one. Why, David? Because David was on the run. Anybody ever felt like you, your life was on the run? You're running for your life? Praise God. Uh, it, well, you know what David felt like. And what happened was David ended up going to the Philistine territory called Gath, and, 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 their, and their, their king was Abimelech. And David was scared of Abimelech. You know why? Because David had killed so many Philistines. Oh, David said, man, if they see me, they're going to cut me from head to toe. Uh, so once he left the prophet, uh, here's what David did. Have you ever had to act crazy to survive? This is in the Bible. I just... <laughs> And David disguised his sanity to remain in humanity. Bible says that David was scribbling on the walls like a crazy man on the doors. Let saliva come down his beard. The king of the enemy said, why you got a mad man around me acting this? Get him out of my face. Praise God. And that's how God delivered David, because he he tried to disguise his sanity and act crazy. So he was not recognizable to the enemy. Praise the mighty name of Jesus. So when David realized that God allowed him to escape his enemies and did not face death, David said, oh, magnify. Y'all ain't even in here. The Lord. <laughs> with me come on and let us exalt his name together has god blessed you to escape from your enemy's snare your enemy's trap they couldn't do to you what they wanted to do to you and god allowed you to get out of that you ought to open up your mouth and give god some glory that i made it i made it i made it i made it he blessed me he blessed me he blessed me he kept me he kept me he kept me and i'm going to rejoice in his name because my god has been good oh magnify the lord with me and let us exalt his name. I said we serve a good God. Anybody know he's a good God? If your test results came back good, I said he's a good God. Give God some praise if your test results came, come on somebody, came back good. And it could have went the opposite way, but God blessed you. Thank you, God. 
Praise his name, church. Don't be ashamed to praise his name. Give him glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. So Peter says, if David found himself there, see, what David wanted was life. And David wanted to have good days. And see, if you desire life, you desire love, and you desire good days, that's what David wrote about. So in order to have life, love, and good days, you got to be obedient to the Lord. Because what David writes in Psalm 34 was, I feared the Lord. He heard my cry. That's why I give him praise. And David said, I want to encourage you. If you're going through trials and tribulations and troubles and testing in your life, if you cry out to God, he can deliver you. And if he delivered me, he can deliver you. So David said, the only reason I was able to do it and escape from my enemy's snare is because I was obedient to God in the midst of my deliverance. He was obedient to God. So when you look at 1 Peter 3 in verse 10, the one who desires life, I got to hasten, the one who desires life to love and to see good days. David said, you got to keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. You got to turn away from evil and start doing good. If you want peace, you got to pursue it. Remember that the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears are open to your prayer. What does that mean? If you're unrighteous, his eyes are on you. And if you're righteous, his eyes are on you. Amen, somebody. And if you want to pray to God, his ears could be closed to the evil and the wicked people, but his ears are open. Come on, somebody, to those who do us right. And if you know you need God to hear you, your prayer if you know you need God to answer your prayer if you know you need God to deliver you when you cry out to God you better do what's right do what's right man if you gotta stand alone stand alone don't don't hang with them friends who on their way to a devil's hell don't hang with folk uh, just because you want a companion. Let me tell you something about eagles. Somebody shout eagles. Eagles fly solo. Pigeons. <clears throat> fly together. I heard somewhere birds of a feather. Come on, somebody. Now you trying to be like the pigeons. Or you're trying to be like the eagle because the eagle can fly alone by himself. The eagle has some skills, some talents and some abilities. The eagle got vision. The eagle is blessed with talons and claws that can swoop down like Superman or superwoman, and he can see uh, beneath the water and see a fish beneath the water because God gave the eagle vision to see stuff other folk can't see. So he knows when to move. He knows when to fly. In other words, he flies high. And I got to say this for the young people, older members, pray for him. I'll be back in a minute. When I say he fly high, I don't mean because he owns something. No, you got to say that these days. You got. He, he wasn't smoking weed, praise God. Okay. He wasn't that kind of high. Lord have mercy. Eagles fly high in terms of altitude. So an eagle, Brother Marables, flies so high that if, if you hang with him, he'll fly at an altitude that may kill you. So if you want to kill some stuff in your life, I feel like busting a 360 through here. Fly high like an eagle and some stuff will die. Gossip will die, praise God. Talking about folk will die. Insulting people will die if you fly high. And I'll say this, I'll say this. Um, you know, I told you, and I'm sticking to this, Brother Wise, because I said it publicly. Uh, by homecoming, your preacher, if the Lord says the same, 
will be 225. Y'all ain't happy for me. I thought I'd get some encouragement. <clears throat> so me and Sister Jones, hear this, me and Sister Jones decided that we were going to go buy some bikes. So we got some mountain bikes. And man, we got all the gear. We got the helmets and everything. We looking crazy with the helmets on, right? Got bikes with all the reflections, neon green and purple, all that stuff. And I didn't know. I hadn't rode a bike in 30 years. And man, trying to ride a bike again after 30 years? And you you just, you, you, you going over here and you going over there, you can't even keep it straight no more, praise God. I'm like, man, I thought I knew how I can drive a car but can't drive a bike. First couple of times, Brother Sanders, it was rough. <clears throat> and then we rode, the second time we rode, it got a little bit easier. And um, we were getting ready to go up a hill. And Sister Jones said, yeah, listen, we, we ain't going fast enough. Uh, and you know me, I'm going slow, just thinking I'm doing good. Because, you know, I, I, I was thinking, I'm just going to shift the gear down to the easiest gear. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but she didn't want to change gears. She said, you got to go a little faster because I don't want it to be so hard when we go up the hill. And what, what, what it dawned on me was when, when, when you're going through life and you're going up hills and you got hills to climb, you got to make sure you go harder at it. I wish I had somebody. You go faster at it and the harder you go at it and the faster you go at it you'll gain some speed and when you get some speed you have some momentum and once you get momentum you don't have to go as fast because you went at it as hard as you can go many of you don't go at, at jesus as hard as you need to go i wish i had somebody many of you don't go at god as hard as you need to go so you can't develop no speed or no momentum listen whatever you're gonna do you got to go at it hard Get some speed going because you don't have to go at it as hard as it if you learn that you got some speed and some momentum and now you can kind of cruise a little bit. But man, I, I tried to go up that little hill. If y'all would have saw me, y'all would have laughed at your preacher. I'm going to my front wheel turning and all this kind of stuff. And she stood up on her wheels and she was going up the hill. And I finally had to say, Lord, have mercy. Help me, Jesus. I got some hills to climb. Amen, somebody. And, and, I, and I thought to myself, we got some hills to climb in life. And many times we don't go, we don't go at life as hard as we need to, as fast as we need to. And, and if you just chilling and you laid back and you never want to apply God's word and come to church and you hearing what God says do and don't want to do it, you ain't going at the word of God hard enough. Go at it fast enough and you're going to develop some speed and eventually you'll be able to cruise when other folk could be struggling up a hill. I wish I had somebody. You'll be able to cruise because you've been reading your Bible every day. You'll be able to cruise because you can quote scripture that no weapon formed against me, brother statement, will prosper. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy come in the morning. And we know God causes all things to work together. Come on, help me. But for good, for those who love God and for those are called according to his purpose. When you hear the word of God, you got to apply it and go hard at it. Go hard at the word of God. And I, you will not regret applying God's word. So we're racing against time. You can't go wrong doing right. I got a question for you. Do you apply the word of God or do you deny the word of God? Because you say, well, Brother Jones, I don't deny the word of God. If you don't apply it, <clears throat> you're denying it. Do you not know you can hear what God wants you to do, understand it, feel good about understanding it, and leave church and never do it? You, you, and you feeling good about church. Not only giving half of your potential. You know, the thing that scares me about death is <clears throat> not death itself. It's the fact that you could leave this world, not have given God fully what you're able to give God. That scares me, man. That scares me that, that, that God could bless you and I with all of these gifts, all of this knowledge, but you left this world unfulfilled. 
could have helped all them people get to heaven. You allowed fear, worry, the issues and the vicissitudes of life to distract you from doing all the good you can do. That's what scares me. And I want to leave you with this. <clears throat> this is very important that you understand. And I'm and I'm out your way. If you know that there is something that God wants you to do, you've heard it preached, you've heard it taught. It's in every Bible class and it's, it's in every study you have. And you're not doing it. Today is your day to make up your mind to apply God's word. If you have 24 hours, just like the rest of us have 24 hours, the distinction is what are you doing with your 24 hours? Because time is ticking. Tick, 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 and we're wasting time. We're wasting energy. We're wasting money on things that have no redemptive value. So I'm telling you, I'm teaching you, I'm pleading with you on today that whatever the Bible says about what God wants you to do, do it now. How many of you want to be one who applies the word of God? My sermon is done. How many of you want to be one who applies the word of God? I'm going to ask you the third time. How many of you want to apply God's word? If you don't apply, you are really just one who has denied. I'm going to end on this one. James 417. <clears throat> James 417. As far as we're going to get today. Do you not know that you can passively um, disobey God passively. See, if you don't do, if you know what God tells you to do and don't do it, you're still sinning. James says, therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it to him, it is sin. So I got a question for you. Do you know the right thing to do. Listen, whatever you're going to do, do it now. If it's time to forgive, do it now. If it's time to make up, do it. If it's time to love your spouse or your family or your church family, if it's time to say yes to Jesus and stop running with the world and getting your word and start running with Jesus, do it. If the Bible says be baptized, for the forgiveness of your sins. Notice what your Bible says. First Peter 3 21 uh, corresponding to that. I wish I had time corresponding to that uh, baptism. Uh, notice that word there. Uh, now somebody shout now. What, what does baptism do? Uh, it saves you. When does it do it now? Not from the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus uh, Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone to heaven after angels and authorities and powers have been subjected to him. Uh, beloved, you got to do it now. What's stopping you from doing what God is commanding you to do now? Now, you got to know something about your mind. Your mind will create fears that are not even there. Your mind knows how to create obstacles that are not even there. Your mind knows how to make up uh, outcomes that never actually happen at all. I want you to know that God, when he when you hear his voice today, when you hear my voice, watch this hard and come on, Bible readers, not your heart. And so I'm telling you to position yourself to be in the best place to be blessed. I'm done. Just go ahead and do whatever God is telling you to do. And you know when to do it? Yeah. Now the question is, are you going to allow your conscience to override God's calling? Because your, your conscience ain't, ain't the word of God sometimes. 
your conscious is made up of experiences and exposures that you've had in your life that you can remember. And some stuff is in your subconscious mind, meaning that you're you're remembering things that you may not understand that you even saw, but they pop up in your mind. Things that you've places you went, things you've heard, things you've seen. It stays sometime in your subconscious mind. But the difference between the conscious and Holy Spirit is conscious may say, you know what? That's not the right thing to do. But Holy Spirit will say, here's the verse, the, the Bible verse for that. So when Holy Spirit is speaking, he's speaking God's word at all times. That's why you need the Holy Spirit. And whatever has entered into your conscious mind is not as powerful as the Holy Spirit. Greater is he who is in me. Come on, somebody. Than he who is in the world. So new birth. We can take over more territory. We can teach more people. We can grow more young men and more young women. If we make our minds up to apply God's word and not wait to tomorrow, not wait to next Sunday, not wait to this Wednesday, get up out your seat and do it now. Stand to your feet. You got to bless folk who don't bless you. You got to do what's right, even if you have to suffer. Now, is God calling you? Jesus, listen to me. Visitors, listen to me. Jesus died for you. All, all, hearts, all hearts are listening to me at this time. Uh, nobody is walking unless you're walking forward. If you're here, I want you to know Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, died for you. He died because he loved you and he wants to give you a second chance at life. He died for you that so that you could have life and not only have it, but have it more abundantly. And so he loves you so much and he wants you to give your life to him today. It's simply make up, making up your mind to say, you know what? I'm going to make a decision to walk with Jesus for the rest of my life. And I want to make it to heaven. I don't want to just make it to heaven, man. I want to have a good life on earth. Like right now. Anybody want to have a good life right now? Well, the word of God will help you do that. Amen. So. So Jesus is calling. Here's what you got to do. Believe in his death. Believe in his burial. Believe in his resurrection. Be willing to make up your mind to repent of all your sins. Feel bad. Confess his name, the son of the living God. And you have to be baptized. Somebody shout baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But your journey with Jesus starts with your a decision to be baptized. And I want you to be baptized and I believe God wants you to not only be baptized, God wants you to do it. How do you do it now? You make up your mind where you're standing. You make up your mind where you're standing. We know you're a sinner. We all have been sinners. Amen, somebody. But God wants to change your state from a sinner to a saint so he can save you. So you come to Jesus right now. Our elders are here to meet you and greet you. And all you got to do is give us your hand and give the Lord your heart. Make up your mind to walk with Jesus. We'll baptize you right now for the forgiveness of your sins so you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Do it now. While together we stand and sing.